yeah, you can have all the coaches you want, but if you don't have the discipline like these two have to go out and actually implement the strategies and, and be open-minded enough to try things that are uncomfortable uh, and push through those feelings of being uncomfortable, then you're not going to be successful. This is The Tournament Code. We appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today. This is kind of a first for The Tournament Code. We've had on one guest before. That's how all of our episodes are. Now we got three guests, so it should be a fun time today. I'm going to preface this all by explaining why we're doing this today. It's unique. Oftentimes, you really don't get to see inside of what it takes to play elite tournament golf. Like Golfers will tell you, about it and they'll say, Hey, my swing coach does this for me. My mental coach does this for me, but you don't get to learn about the relationship firsthand from those people. You don't get the back and forth stories of what's gone on. It's like on the PJ tour. One of the things I enjoy the most is hearing the caddies and players talk with each other live, uh, not hearing Faldo over the back, talking over everyone, but actually hearing what's going on, what's going through everyone's mind. And fortunately we're blessed today to have a group of people here who can kind of give us an insight on what it takes for having a productive mental coach relationship. So if you're listening, whether you are a junior golfer and you're like, Hey, I might want a mental coach. If you are a competitive college golfer, you might have one, or you might be thinking about having one. And even if you're like me, a mid am there's benefit in having a mental coach. And so for us today, we kind of want to see if you were to have a mental coach, what's the benefit of it for you. And then beyond that, we also want to learn about how, Dr. J in particular here has worked with Lorenzo and Grace and also just about Lorenzo and Grace's careers as they go off to college here and see kind of what a progressive succession junior golf has been like for them. So with my monologue there out of the way, let's start with you, Grace. Tell us just how you got into the game of golf. So I started golf a lot later than most people, I would say. Because I was initially a figure skater. It wasn't until I think it was like eight that my dad like bought me like plastic golf clubs and he'd like have me occasionally come swing in the basement with him. And of course, it was just plastic, so I wouldn't cause any harm in the basement. But I didn't really know how to really swing a club other than my dad teaching me in the basement. So it wasn't, yeah, I started pretty late and then I started competitive golf. So like, playing more summer tournaments, probably going into my freshman year of high school because like once high school started, my mom was like, you had to choose between either skating or golf. So that's when I made my big choice and then I switched to golf and started focusing there. Very cool. What was the transition like from competitive skating to golf? Ooh, well, I'd say they're both individual sports, so I definitely still had that mentality of relying on myself at the end of the day. Skating, it was, I felt I had less of a chance to make up for my mistakes because for skating, when you compete in a program, it's two minutes long and you fall on a jump, you get points deducted and that's pretty much it. You don't get a second chance. Golf, on the other hand, you have 18 holes. So if you have one shot that you don't hit good um, or even one hole, you still have 17 other holes or like 71 other shots to hit. So it was definitely a change in my mind or like just how I like viewed the sport and how I walked into it and how I had to like change how I set my mentality when going into a tournament. Interesting. It's funny how you phrase that like golf, you have so much time to make up things and that things can get better because a lot of people look at it the opposite way that I made a double bogey on five and uh uh-oh, that has crushed my entire round. It's unique to hear that perspective from you. We'll roll back to that in a little bit. Tell us a little bit about where you are right now, golf-wise, where you are academically, and what your plans are coming up. So I'll be continuing my academic and athletic career at University of Michigan. I did attend Rochester Adams High School. For four years, and then uh, that's pretty much it. I did. I played on the Adams varsity high school team for about three years. I didn't play my junior year, but 
senior year, we definitely had a successful season. There we go. Successful season. <laughs> um, so that was, I was really happy. We ended pretty well with that. And then now I'm starting college golf. So it should be a new chapter of my life. That's awesome. Now, Lorenzo, switching to you, you're also headed off to college. Where are you headed to? Uh, I'll be playing at Michigan State. So uh, there's a little bit of okay, so you guys are over rivalry right now in the room. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I was that's what I was getting to that's what I was getting to first. Now, before we talk about how you got to Michigan State, tell us about how you started playing golf. Well, I've always been playing golf like forever, and I think I started when I was two. And there's actually evidence of that if you don't believe me. So if you go on YouTube, there's a video of me swinging at uh, where's it? Where's that? Oh, someplace, but. Uh, so it's on YouTube, but no, 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 no. It was in a dome. Gosh, it's like, it's like an amusement. It's like a, a park place. I forgot. I'm blanking on the name right now, but, um, so I, I've been swinging since I was two, been playing since I was uh, six tournament wise. And so golf has been a part of me ever since I was little and I got into it because of my dad. And, um, originally my dad's from the Philippines and, uh, he uh, moved here. I don't know when, but he did. And he picked up the game and he really loved it. And so uh, one day he was uh, watching golf on the TV and I decided as a two-year-old to go pick up a stick and try to imitate the golfers on TV. So he had the idea of buying me golf clubs, plastic ones. And then uh, from there, I started hitting an actual ball with a plastic club and I was making good contact. So then we just started building up to real clubs and, and I'm here right now. So That is awesome. That sounds like a lot of dad's dreams out there. You know, a lot of a lot of kids find golf boring, but I don't know. My kid is only a month old or something, so we'll see what he's like. But in any case, if I'm sure as a dad, it's probably enjoyable if your kid likes the same things that you like. So uh, he encouraged you in that. He helped foster that for you. Tell us about your road to Michigan State and competitive golf through high school. So... I got recruited at the end of my sophomore year, June 15th, I remember it. They gave me a phone call that day. And that's the first day that coaches can call you. So early on, they showed a lot of interest and they continued to show interest throughout until I committed. So I pursued that. And then during high school, unfortunately, we didn't have a freshman season because of COVID. And that really bummed me out because I was really excited to play. And I thought that we would win a state championship pretty easily. So sophomore year, we won a state championship. I placed second at states. Junior year, we we won another state championship. I also, I placed second again. So going into this year, I had one goal to check off and that was to win Mr. Or two goals actually, uh, was to win individual states and to win Mr. Golf. And so this year I was able to win individually by shooting 10 under for two days. And I ended up getting Mr. Golf this year too. And I I forgot to mention, I played at a brother rice, brother rice high school. Very cool. You got Mr. Golf. Like that's nice. uh, bookend on a high school career. Now you got to go off to college. Tell us a few of the things that you might be like some of the uncertainties about college. I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you a little bit about my quick journey to college and how that worked out for me. You know a little bit about how it didn't work out for me. I got into the game of golf late, didn't start playing competitive golf till my sophomore year. And I got, I was very fortunate enough to get a spot at Belmont. And when I got there, I was like, okay, over that summer before I got injured, I was like, all right, I think I can compete. Like, I think I can play. Like I wasn't the best of junior golfers. I wasn't highly touted or anything, but I was learning quickly and figuring out how to get the ball in the hole. But when you start playing against a whole new group of guys, you got to go out and not necessarily beat them, but you got to still get the ball in the hole. But there's all sorts of different pressures that come with it. There's different things that come with qualifying. Tell us kind of what you're looking forward to both in college and kind of maybe some of the things that some of the challenges you think you'll face. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to the freedom I'll have in college. And that's one thing that I, I can't wait to experience. And, you know, how, what I'm going to do with that freedom you know, how I'm going to, because I mean, on campus, I can do whatever I want. I can practice as much as I can. I mean, the golf course and the facilities are only about three minutes away. 
So I want to see how I'm going to do what or what I'm going to do with the time I have. And, you know, and then, you know, just because college, we have a we have nine people on our team. They only take five every week. So it's kind of uncertain whether I'm going to make the lineup and, you know, what are the scores I need to post for three days or three tournament or three qualifying rounds to, to make the lineup. And I mean, that is my goal to make the lineup every single tournament for fall and spring. and. That's that's pretty much it. You know, Lorenzo, so you've talked a couple times about goal setting and you're pretty open about, you know, what you want to do and how you set those goals. Is that something that you've worked with Dr. Jay on or have you always been open about your goals? No, I actually remember we uh, we had a, a little session about goals and he made it he made me write it on a whiteboard a whiteboard. And so, uh, I mean, ever since that, I've kind of realized that I need to start setting some benchmarks and some goals just so I can reward myself when I accomplish them. And it'll give me some motivation and keep me on the right track to, to keep fighting for those goals. And Grace, are there any, not just goals that you have coming up this year, but also challenges that you foresee and also things that you're looking forward to? Definitely. I'd say that one of the challenges that I'm I would say going into college would be trying to balance my academics along with uh, athletics because I know Michigan ath- academics is extremely hard and to be able to also balance like D1 golf with that with the schedule that we have and the, and the qualifying rounds I think that I'd have to learn from others as well as learn from myself how to improve on things that I probably need improvement on. But I am excited to be able to practice with my teammates because I know growing up, I've always done individual sports and it's just, it hasn't been, I feel like it's going to be a different environment, being able to work with other team members, learning from them, especially from the upperclassmen, rather than always practicing by myself. And sometimes I may not be able to figure out something, but if I had my teammate next to me, then I think that getting that help would definitely be a lot better. Teammates can both be a blessing and a curse. Some of my lifelong friends are teammates of mine. And I can also tell you my freshman year definitely got into fights with some of them. Even Ashton, who's a buddy of ours, who was a senior, there was a few incidents where he and I were, had had harsh words for each other. And that's, that's also the fun is building that bond and friendship. Now, tell us, Grace, how'd you get connected with Dr. J and how long have you been working with him? I actually got connected with Dr. J through Lorenzo um, because he was the one that was telling me how it helped him a lot. And then I think I, once I started competitive golf, it was a couple months after that Lorenzo really recommended Dr. J. So I was like, okay, I'll go check it out. But it's been about three to four years since like that I've been working with him. That is awesome. Lorenzo, what did you tell Grace to get her to decide to go to Dr. J? Um, I just said that you're going to start winning tournaments once you start getting some <laughs> getting some uh, lessons with Dr. J. So, and she's been I paid yeah. him well for that comment. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the things that you guys worked on, Grace or Dr. J? You can both answer this one. Yeah, I'd love to jump in. I mean, first and foremost, thanks for having us here. These two young people are really special in my life. You know, I've known both of them since they were 14, you know, playing junior golf and to get to watch them grow and accomplish the goals that, you know, they set out. I just kind of coached them through it, but they had their, their minds made up about what they wanted to accomplish. And they had wonderful family support uh, along the way as well. And these their families raised wonderful human beings. So it's a it's a joy and honor and a pleasure to you know help them achieve the success that that they have started to to see and a lot of it's come recently it's been a wave tidal wave of accolades and awards in the last couple of months for both of them and and then capped off by going to two great Big Ten universities to to fulfill their dreams moving forward so I'm excited to see what's going to happen in terms of you know getting to know them you know I knew Lorenzo first obviously uh, a few months before Grace and. I think the one thing I'd like to just kind of say about Lorenzo and his personality is, you know, Lorenzo and I work very well together. The thing I appreciated a lot about Lorenzo was his healthy level of skepticism uh, about things, right? Um, He's a very um, self-starter, thinks for himself, but not too much where he's not open-minded to be coached. 
And I think that's a great balance for him to have. Uh, and at the same time, Grace is always very inquisitive, asking amazing, tough questions, c- catching me off guard quite often with the questions she was asking about, you know, how to think about something or how to prepare for something. They both came to me working on different things, you know, so we can definitely get into that tonight. But uh, it's just an honor to see them both here and, and growing up uh, right before my very eyes. It's been quite awesome. Tell us a little bit, Grace, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Dr. J, a little back and forth, and then we'll do the same thing with Lorenzo and Dr. J. Grace, tell us when you first came to Dr. J, what did you want to work on? Did you know the right things to work on? And what did what did you end up uh, doing? So I'd say, so starting golf, I definitely did not know how to control my emotions. And I feel like a lot of people could say that. But I remember one of my very first think, sessions coming into Dr. J was learning about pressure and that has like honestly stuck with me like ever since the first lesson because it he was like okay well first pressure is like you care about it i know that like the outcome is always uncertain and then the third one was your judge so like this pressure could either be a threat or an opportunity and so every time i always think about that and i always have to like narrow it down to like how i would change my perspective of it but i say one of my most like important things I wanted to work on was controlling my emotions, especially since during recruiting seasons, I knew that a lot of college coaches would be watching how you react to your shots. And it's not even about half the time, like if you don't play well, like that's fine. We all have bad days, but it's just how you react, how you, how your body language is during the game. I know we worked on body language a lot and how you treat your opponents. And a lot of it was just being able to understand myself and also my golf game at the same time. Another thing was learning like my mental traps. I knew that sometimes I'd get off tap or unfocused from my golf game and it would be either I'd be upset about a shot or I'd start thinking about something negative that wouldn't help my game. So I'd have to learn to stop myself, um, which we learned overcoming adversity. So it was just kind of like finding techniques that would help me take a step back, breathe, and just be able to go back to my routine and going back to my game. Dr. J, tell us a little bit more about when Grace first came with you. I'm, I don't know what kind of sports performance coach, patient, privilege slash confidentiality there <laughs> is, but you guys being here, you've waived at least some of that, I imagine, between the, between the three of you. So tell us a little bit about what it was like. Well, yeah, I'm not going to disclose anything personal at all. I think Grace nailed it. I mean, we talked about all those things and I'm super amazed that she remembers word for word what we talked about, you know, in that first session, you know, but Grace is right. You know, she came wanting to manage her emotions, her nerves, things like that. Mental traps was certainly one thing we talked about, which is, you know, things we think about that are outside of our control that distract us from being present. And also a lot of it uh, early on for her too was simple stuff like course management, you know, like really understanding how to, how to play a good round of golf how to think around a course and the right kind of shots to hit. I think a big thing for Grace too was owning her own confidence. Um, She definitely has come a ton, a long way on that as well. And how to talk to herself, the narrative in her mind, and then being confident to attack the course. I know we had a session about talking about that as well, just going after it, trusting her abilities and learning how to play golf and not golf swing when she was out there as well. And not worrying too much about where her body was uh, in her swing and just going out there and competing and also balancing her life. Because as she mentioned earlier, grades in her academics are super important to her. And so golf is not everything. Golf is something she does. It's not all she is. And, you know, we talk a lot about uh, being a person, not just a player when you're out there as well. So over the years of working with her and actually, you know, with both of these guys being on the course with them a couple of times, Played around with Grace. I think I've been out twice with Lorenzo, kind of walking through shots, talking about things, just helping them learn what, helping me learn what they are thinking and how they are behaving under pressure. Because we'd play games out there as well and challenge them while we were playing so they could put what we talk about in the office into practice on the course. Lorenzo, tell us a little bit about what your first sessions with Dr. J were like. Same thing, kind of when you went to him, what you were thinking you need to work on, what you ended up actually working on and a little bit more about your journey with them. 
I think the number one thing I was working to kind of manage was pressure. And I mean, other than that, I kind of went in a little bit like just open-minded and just wanted to know what he wanted to say. And there wasn't like really a specific thing. I really wanted to, to you know, focus on to like fix, but pressure was one of them and managing pressure and probably as well as like anger management on the course, as you would say. And so that, those were the things that we kind of got into first. So. It's funny. I'm looking at my notes as we're talking about these things and looking back, it's like being nostalgic here, but you know, and Lorenzo kind of in quotes, you know, he wanted to have a calm mind and not get angry <laughs> was something he said to me <laughs> as a 14 year old. And, you know, and I also think, you know, Lorenzo had extremely and probably still does very high expectations for himself. And he's got a family that supports him in that. I think patience was a big thing for Lorenzo. I think any 14 year old, you know, you want things now and it's hard to kind of see how things are going to develop down the road. So we worked hard on developing a sense of patience that things take time. Uh, there is no magic button that's going to fix everything. And how to recover quickly from mistakes is uh, Grace alluded to as well, you know, to make sure that we have a system for that, how to notice when our emotions are getting the best of us and how to stop and regroup and take a breath and let's get back into our routine and back into that present moment. So, you know, we went through a lot of the similar things that, that Grace mentioned as well with Lorenzo. You know, I don't have a program, so to speak, but um, as 14 year olds, they have to have some fundamentals in the mental game that we had to cover. So I remember, you know, when I was a junior golfer, there's a lot of different levels of tournaments and you obviously want to play at the highest level, ultimately get to a power five school like you guys are going to go to. And so when you're playing as a junior, you know, there's the golf week tour, there's the AJGA qualifiers, there's the AJGAs, then, you know, there's the highest level like AJGA Invitationals, U.S. Junior Ams, things like that. Just talk about, you know, how you guys advanced through all those levels and ultimately got to the to the highest level because I think it would just be good for junior golfers out there listening to hear somebody's path to the top. The first ever tournament I played was TGA, which is focused on really, really little kids and like beginners. And so I did that starting at six, played my first tournament at U.S. Kids when I was eight. And I played U.S. Kids for probably six years or, yeah, six years after that. And then I moved into golf weeks and then got good at those, started winning a lot of those. And then while I was doing, while I was in my phase of golf weeks, I was doing like AJJ qualifiers and stuff. And I probably did those for two years. Um, how old, how old were you when you were doing, doing these golf weeks and um, stuff? Probably, I think I remember I was 13 when I hit my first one, maybe 12. And I also forgot I was doing some top 50s in there as well, uh, which is locally for, for Michigan. And so uh, I did golf weeks and I was trying to qualify for AJGAs. And I think at around three years ago, um, I started being able to have enough stars to where I didn't really need to qualify anymore. I could just apply and get in. And so um, after that, it's just been I kind of stopped playing golf leagues just because I can get into a lot of AJGAs and focus more on AJGAs. And uh, ever since then, I've been focusing on like the bigger junior events, such as the junior PGA, the US junior, the Western was another one that um, I got into. And um, once you're at that level, that's honestly kind of just like the level before you get to college, those big tournaments. And so that's where I was, I think, probably about two years ago is when I kind of solidified myself into those like just playing the majors and stuff for me well as I said like I started golf late so it was definitely my timeline was shifted a little more up I probably started out with top 50s and then I started slowly advancing to like Meyer Callaway and then like golf week and then AJGA qualifiers AJGAs and then a lot of the invites so it was definitely my timeline was a lot smaller so I definitely had to sacrifice a lot of my time to just continue to practice uh, my swing technique mentally, physically. So, I mean, it was pretty much the same as lunges, but just a little shortened and more. I had less time to work. Grace, you've said you felt in a lot of golf that you felt the need to be perfect and you wanted to work on emotional control, specifically about the need to be perfect. I think everyone feels that. And as you mentioned earlier, in the round earlier in the conversation, one of the nice things about golf is if you have a mistake, if something goes wrong, there's good things can still happen. Whereas in uh, competitive skating, 
you have two minutes and then that's it. Tell us about a specific circumstance, a specific tournament, something like that, where you felt challenged, where you felt that need to be perfect and the challenge that came from that in the tournament. I would say like it's like a lesson that I learned from this one tournament. So last year I played the USGA girls junior qualifier and I, I unfortunately was first alternate because I lost in a playoff. And so this year, my coach and I were like, okay, like, let's try to qualify this year. And I, so I think I went into that tournament having like such high expectations for myself, like, like telling myself, oh, I could totally make it. I could totally like, get in. I'm going to qualify. And I think after playing it, I realized that like, I can't walk into a tournament setting expectations for myself because in reality, like we can't set expectations. There's, we can't expect anything from golf. Golf is um, a hard game, and it's, we're definitely not perfect. At the end, I think going into a tournament, you have a lot. Something that's helped me a lot is walking in and saying, like, this is a tournament, not with, like, yes, it's with my opponents, but I can't really think about that. It's more me and the golf course. So I have to kind of change my perspective walking into it and mainly just go out, have fun. I can't really just tell myself, oh, I'm going to qualify. So it's more of just me and the course. Dr. J, when you're working with students on that mentality, what, what are you preaching and kind of how do, you, how do you help train students so that they don't put too much pressure on themselves? Grace gave us a great definition of pressure earlier that you've given us to tell us how you try to keep their expectations in the right place. And I, I'm going to add something to that also. How do you balance having that mindset and having, you know, a goal like Lorenzo, you know, I want to win the state tournament, but not going into the state tournament thinking, you know, I got to win this tournament. So I'll answer the second part first. I mean, I think the goals are great. I think you know, we all talked about having ultimate goals and performance goals and process goals when we work together. And I wanted them to have that vision for what they wanted to achieve. But obviously on the course, that's not what we're focused on. We stay focused on the process to get there and the things that we can control, our attitude, effort, how we prepare, our response to things, acceptance of shots, controlling our routines and things like that. And then going back to the first part, what Daniel was asking is whenever we have a big event, like, you know, if Grace is going to that, that USGA, you know, girls junior qualifier is first and foremost, how do we want to show up? What's the identity we want to have leading up to this tournament? Like when I walk out of my car and I step up to the course, like who am I that day? And you got to have a good sense of what your beliefs are walking up. And then what are those intentions for that day? Not so much the goal or the outcome, but what am I intending to do out here? For example, I'm going to compete. I'm going to stick with my process no matter what. I'm going to trust my abilities. I'm going to be an athlete today. I'm not going to play golf swing. I'm going to play golf. Also, trying to understand what distractions might be there. Might there be a player there that I don't like or maybe somebody that I do like? And are those distractions? And what am I going to do about that? And so helping an athlete mentally prepare for all those scenarios, I think, takes some of the pressure off. Because even if those things don't happen, at least we had a plan for it. And how am I going to prepare off the course as well? Like what is going to be the preparation leading up to it? We often talked about the night before routine with these guys. Like, hey, what are you going to do the night before, you know, to help yourself get ready? You're going to read the yardage book and look at video. Are you going to stretch? Are you going to hydrate, eat right, get enough sleep, check your bag, make sure you have everything. Like take care of all those little details ahead of time to take some of that pressure off those potentially pressure packed situations. Some of the biggest foot faults that Cooper and I have made and some of them were together uh me catting for him and vice versa is not doing a lot of the easy things right uh even playing i've probably told this one plenty of times on here playing in the jones cup you know it's a nice event down in sea island and we show up the first day i'm catting for cooper like we've gone through our practice round i got my yards book with all my notes on it we get out the first day and i'm like hmm i don't know where my yards book is and we play. We ended up having to play all three rounds without my yardage book. Wouldn't have probably done as much more good, but it would have been at least better if I'd prepared for that. Lorenzo, you mentioned you wanted to work on feeling pressure as well when you're out on the course, making sure that you have it in the right place. Tell us about some specific circumstances that you were in where 
maybe you felt pressure and you didn't react the way that you would hope to. And then some about how your work with Dr. J has influenced how you handle pressure. Oh, well, I got great examples because I've really grown with how to deal with pressure um, for a long time. And so one of the really, 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 I mean, I'll never forget this story ever, is uh, I think I was 14 and I was qualifying for the U.S. Junior. Uh, we were out at Michigan's course. Basically, I played around with my I mean, he, he caddied for me and I played great. I, just, I was just having a great time out there. And I didn't expect anything just because all these guys were like 18 and 16 just because the U.S. Junior is hard to get in. So I found myself waiting for two hours because I was in a playoff for a spot. And so it was a three people for two spots playoff. And all I had to do was just make it out. And one guy was going to get eliminated. And so there was so much pressure on myself just because... I was like, oh my gosh, I'm this close to playing the U.S. Junior. Oh my goodness, this this could be big. And so, honestly, that was probably. I mean, I was shaking, and I couldn't even I couldn't control myself. One guy made an easy par. He hit it down the center, and I was the last to tee off. And this guy in front of me, the second guy to tee off, ripped it ob. And I was so flustered and so out of it at that moment because of so much pressure. I, I couldn't even think and I couldn't even realize that, oh my gosh, all I need to do is just make sure I get into the fairway. I mean, he's not going to make five, he's going to make six. But I, I'm thinking about that now in, in hindsight. And so I'm in play, but there's weeds and it's in my backswing. And so we're looking for this guy's ball, which, which was OB because it was in the weeds too, but that thing was gone. And so my caddy was up helping and I was just so flustered that I went and hit without my caddy talking with me and I basically hid into the weeds because the the my club caught got caught into the weeds on my downswing and it closed and so I scrambled on the rest of that hole we both ended up making double so par made it out all I needed to do was make bogey we go to the next hole I make double again because I was still so nervous and uh, I ended up not making I was first all three but um, so that was one of the situations that I'll never forget and one of the situations that kind of show that how much I've grown with dealing with pressure. And so, I mean, one of the things that we've been doing, I mean, there's multiple things that we've been, we, that we've done to help me work with dealing with pressure was um, like the bubble lesson, you know, staying in your own bubble and not worrying about what other people think. And um, the controllables was a good lesson there too and what I can control. And uh, not worrying about what other people can do, and um, staying in the present moment is a huge, huge thing. That even even now I think about just staying in the present moment. That stuff for I mean four years I think right. Just those lessons and compiling them all together and putting it into my game now has really uh, helped me succeed. And a good example of when I deal I dealt with pressure in a really really good way was last week for the USAM qualifier. And so the USAM qualifier was out here at Acres West. And I played the first 18 holes, one under. I finished birdie birdie in my first 18. And I found myself about four strokes, three strokes back. There wasn't that much pressure. I mean, I knew I had to shoot like eight under to get in just because four under was the lead. There's like a couple people at four under. And so... I knew I was in it a little bit. I knew I could get into it, but I knew I was a little bit far. So I played my first two holes. Or I played my first three holes two over. So I was one over for the tournament with, um, what was it, like 15 to play. And at that point, I was just like, you know, I'm just going to play golf and not even think about, you know, making it or, or doing anything. And so I just kind of went out to blackout mode and just started you know, not thinking too much about the putts, not thinking about the shots and, you know, just, just playing golf and letting it flow. And from there I shot nine under with 15 holes left to play. I ended up shooting eight under for the tournament and making it out. And so that it's, it's kind of like, uh, the two opposite sides of the whole entire spectrum there where one story is where I can't deal with pressure. And another story is where I kind of pushed it onto the side. Honestly, I even used it to feel myself. I knew I was feeling pressure on the last hole of the tournament. I kind of knew I was already in just because of how I finished. I shot 29 on, on my back nine. I knew I was juiced. I knew there was a lot of pressure. So I ended up clubbing down on the last hole because I knew 
of how much adrenaline I had, and it ended up I ended up using it to my advantage, taking a lower club and sticking it close on the last hole. So I just just learned how to deal with that. At what point in that second round did it kind of change from I'm just trying to play golf and have fun and roll these putts into you know I got a chance to make it, and you you know at that point I'm assuming you started feeling some nerves. I kind of just I mean. With 15 holes left to play, my 12th hole, I mean, I went, I went birdie, double, and then bogey, and so I was kind of just like, well, there he goes. I mean, I have to do something crazy if I want to make it now. So then that's when I started playing golf and just just playing golf, not even thinking too much, not even overreading the putts. You see the putt, you hit it. You see the shot, you hit it. And I was just hitting everything the way it is. And so that was that point. I don't know I just I stayed super super present. And to be honest. When I stepped up to my last hole of that qualifier, I didn't even know what I was at. I mean, it was kind of just like 15 holes went by like that. And I just woke up. I was on the ninth hole, which is, which I started on 10. So my last hole, and I was just like, oh, shoot. I really did that. These last 15, 14 holes, I really did all that. And yeah. Dr. J, Lorenzo mentioned the bubble lesson and a few other things. Tell us a little bit about those concepts and how you teach those students and also help them practice that. Yeah. I mean, it's nothing crazy. It's just the idea that, Hey, when you step up to a shot, you have to pretend that you are stepping into a soundproof bubble that it's just you. And if you have a caddy, your caddy, or just you and the ball and the hole and then, and then begin the routine. So we talk a lot about club selection. We go through a process of identifying the wind and the elevation, the lie, the distance, making sure uh, we have the right club in our hand. And I think what Lorenzo just said also earlier was understanding your adrenaline, because that has uh, something to do with it as well. Like if you're really pumped up, you might club down uh, as well in that situation. And then trusting it. And then going through the pre-shot routine. So there's various types of pre-shot routines. I'm a big believer in standing behind the ball, taking some deep breaths or one deep breath, understanding and committing to the situation you're in and selecting and committing to your target and then visualizing that shot, lining yourself up and executing that shot. And the point behind that is to go through that process helps you block out all other distractions because you have something to do. You have a checklist or a process that you need to go through before you're allowed even to step up to the ball and hit it. So by focusing on those steps helps you block out what happened before, what happened in the future, what your score is, et cetera. And it's not totally perfect every time, but it gives us the best chance to be as present as possible. And then after the shot, accepting it. Is it good? Great. Is it bad? Okay. Well, what was it about it that was bad? Without judgment, put the club back in the bag. When the club goes back in the bag, we always say the bubble pops. And now we're free to talk and do whatever. Walk down the fairway, talk to your caddy, your playing partners. But as you walk up to that next shot, we begin that process all over again with a new bubble. And going through it shot by shot by shot. Dr. J, when it comes to preparation for a tournament, you know, there's some swing work that people do, et cetera. What sort of mental things are you encouraging them to work on preparation wise in whatever facet or form they may take? Yeah. So I think one we haven't alluded to is, you know, the use of good imagery and visualization. Now, I taught both of them about a process to get into a mental state where they can visualize clearly. So we go through some breathing and relaxation techniques and then close our eyes and picture the holes are going to play. We also picture ourselves in tough situations. A lot of times people, when they visualize, they only want to see perfection. Well, as we talked about earlier in golf, that's not going to happen. So sometimes it's good to see yourself in a tough spot, to begin your visualization behind a tree or in the rough or in the weeds or off the green and in a trap. Not that you want to visualize the bad shot that got you there, but visualize beginning from that spot so you can learn what it feels like mentally to get out of those tough situations. So a lot of preparation was with imagery. Uh, we also worked on things called concentration drills, where the, the guys would um, scratch off some numbers in order under pressure of a clock, concentration grids. There's apps out there for that as well. Also, as we alluded to, what did we do the night before? How do we prepare mentally and physically the night before? And when we get to the course, what's going to be our warm-up routine? I'm a big believer in when you get to the course on a tournament day to warm up, it should just be for that, to warm up, not find a swing. So go there, get your body loose so you feel comfortable with your swing. 
but not necessarily looking for the swing that day. That makes sense. So pop quiz here for Grace and Lorenzo. We'll start with Grace. Tell us about what your pre-tournament routine actually looks like. No saying things just so Dr. J hears things that he likes. So like bef- like the night before or is it like the day of? We'll start we'll start the night before cuz that's that's again that's where Cooper and I have definitely lost ground ourselves even when it comes to estimating how long it takes to get to a place and when we need to wake up. So tell us about your process starting then and working into the day of all the way up until you hit that first tee shot. All right. Well, so I mean, I don't really try to like think of it that much because the more I think about it, I feel like the more kind of like pressure I have. So I, so like, let's just say like, you're going to go play golf with your friend. Like I would just think of like preparing it for that instead of like, Oh, I'm going to this big tournament. Like I feel like that just puts more pressure on yourself. So usually I definitely go to bed a little bit earlier than usual, but not too early. Cause sometimes when I get too much sleep, I don't want to play that well, <laughs> but I make sure that my yardage book is all in my bag. All my, I always have three balls in my bag and I make sure all of them are marked beforehand. I have enough gloves and it depends on the weather the next day. If I have, if I have my rain gear or if I need any extra clothes, then I put it all in my car. I have my cart, shoes, just basically what I need for golf, my bag. And I always make sure that I have my clubs cleaned before because I don't want any dirt in my ears or anything. So it's pretty much just a normal normal night, but just going to bed a little early and just eating a healthy dinner as well as eating a healthy breakfast the next morning and preparing my snacks and uh, my lunch. So yeah, it, it's not that I don't make it like a big deal because I don't want to make it seem like, oh, I'm going somewhere super important, but I am. But you got to mentally tell yourself like, it's just a normal day of golf. Like I'm out there to have fun. So yeah. What does the warm up look like for you? Uh, is there just, is, not just with the clubs, is there any sort of pre-round? Like some, sometimes people, like I personally sometimes have a mini workout almost that I do that helps loosen me up. But I'm also getting older. Well, I kind of have a routine of how I like to go in and practice. Well, in the morning, I usually kind of stretch, warm up my muscles like beforehand going to the course. But once I get to the course and I take all my bags off, I would always go to the putting green first and I use my Pell's putting like board. So like I wouldn't really feel the greens then, but just to make sure I have like I'm starting the ball online, just getting like my swing in, warming up my muscles. Then I'd usually go once it hits like less than an hour mark to my tea time, go to the range. Range takes like 20, 30 minutes. Definitely stretch beforehand. Um, do my, cause my trainer and I have come up with some of like stretching drills. So I do stretch, make sure my muscles are warmed up so I don't hurt myself. Hitting the range, I don't really hit a lot of balls cause one thing that Dr. Novetz or Dr. J have and I have worked on is like sometimes I wouldn't have the best range session and I'd have to tell myself like the range is 100% different than the course. So I have to get myself in the mindset of like, okay, well, I'm here just for warm up. I'm not here to like, I'm not at the range to play the course. It's just warming up my, my body, getting contact with the club. And then afterwards, I'd go and feel the greens measure my paces just to find out how much I need to swing for each of my putts. And once my, about like 10 minutes before, 15 minutes before I take a little break and I'm just out there having, trying to go have fun. Kind of going back to something you said earlier, what, are, what are, what are some of the things you're eat, eating on the golf course during a tournament? My uh, trainer and I definitely talked about this a lot. So usually if, if it's like, depends on my tea time, I definitely have a sandwich, any sandwich that has enough protein in it. I do add a lot of fruits and then nuts. I do have also like beef jerky to like um, increase protein, but it's more of just like having that energy. I know it's like weird to say, but like you just got to have to constantly eat. You can't eat by the time you're hungry because then your body's like already out of energy. So it's just constantly fueling with like enough protein and just, yeah, keeping up your energy. And I also, sorry, I also do drink uh, liquid IV and it helps with hydration and also energy. So that does help a lot too. 
I just want to jump in for a second. I think it's great that Grace is talking to her trainers and her you know, people about that because she's right. It's, if you wait till you're hungry, it's too late. And it's not only about the physical energy you need. We now know from a lot of research, and there's a great book called Thinking Slow and Fast, about you know, there's different systems in our brain and the logical planning that we have to go through mentally to prepare for shots, to think our way around the course burns a lot of glucose in our system. And so it's important for uh, these young athletes to realize that every other hole, they should take a bite of something. And maybe on the other holes, they should have a sip of water or liquid IV or something to keep hydrated um, because you're going to be burning that energy, not just by swinging the club and walking, but by thinking. Thinking burns a lot of energy and fuel as well. Chess players, I know, burn a lot of energy just playing chess. And when you're out there, especially in a tournament round, you're thinking a lot, but you're also dealing with that feeling of pressure and managing it, trying to work on your process, going in and out of your bubble. And that takes a lot of effort. Lorenzo, tell us a little bit about your pre-tournament routine and what things look like for you. Well, something that I've just started recently was marking my balls the night before. And usually I start I start a tournament with six balls. Very first day, got to have six balls in the bag. Mark all of them, which I just started doing starting two tournaments ago, which is really nice because now I don't have to worry about marking them. I just pick them up. And so I do that and then make sure I get enough sleep. Usually I aim for more than eight, around 10 hours. So I shoot for, for 10. And then occasionally, I mean, usually I just treat every, everything normal, just like a normal night. But occasionally, if I know the course and I know I, I've played well and I know that I play there a lot, um, usually sometimes I'll go to bed and right before bed, I kind of close my eyes and just visualize like the holes and, and the shots. I don't do that for every single tournament because I don't know a lot of courses like, like the back of my hand, but for the courses that I do know for the back of my hand, I like to do that and just kind of picture myself succeeding on that course because I already have. So I'm kind of just uh, revamping those memories just so I can get comfortable with it. And so that's pretty much my, uh, my pre-routine to the night before. And usually I'm really lucky. My mom is really nice and she takes care of me a lot. And so she makes sure that uh, me and my brother have a lot of stuff in my bag to eat and to drink. And so I never have to worry about that, but I'm sure that's going to change because of college and she won't be there for me, but so. Well, you can always ask your coach to pack your lunch <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, as far as the day of, walk us through the day of kind of what things are going on mentally for you and your pre-round warm-up, if there's anything specific that you're doing. Yeah, just keep it light usually in the morning, just like how you wake up every single day. Usually wake up with a smile, at least try to not really thinking a lot about the tournament while I'm making my commute to the, to the golf course. When I warm up, I usually go straight to the range. I divide it. So my time block is 50 minutes of time. I do 30 minutes on the range, 20 minutes on the punting green. And so usually I'll do, I'll always hit a 58. I'll always hit that. I'll hit a chip shots and then start hitting some like 90%. And then after that, it depends on if it's an odd day or an even day. So if it's the 18th, I'll hit 8-iron, 6-iron, 4-iron. Then always hit 3-iron, always hit 3-wood, always hit driver. And then if it's an if it's an odd day, I'll go 9-iron, 7-iron, 5-iron. And then always hit 3-iron, always hit 3-wood, driver. And so I usually do that. And then at the end, once I'm done hitting driver, I usually go back to the wedges and make sure that, you know, because I've been hitting the longer clubs for a couple of balls, I want to go back to the shorter clubs and get back to my chip shots. And so when I go on the putting green, usually the first thing I'll do, I don't do this all the time, is I put out a mirror, put on a three-foot straight putt, make sure my mechanics are good, make sure my feel is fine, I'm hitting the ball on line. And usually when I know I can hit the ball where I want to, that's when I'm putting really good. Because then I don't work, I don't focus on, you know, the swing or the putting stroke and, you know, where the face is. I usually just focus on the speed. And when I, ha when I just focus on the speed, that's when I start making a lot of putts because that's when, when you have really good speed, that's when you kind of, it's easier to make putts because of how it enters the hole, you know, because harder hit putts, the hole becomes smaller pretty much. 
And so when you're focusing on the speed, you can easily get to, you know, perfect speed where the hole could drift into. So that's, that's why I usually, I make sure I am hitting the, starting the ball off where I want to. And then I'll work, I'll just work up progressively to six footers, 10 footers, and then just start doing some long 40 footers just for some feel. And that's my routine. So very cool. Well, I'm, we're, we've gone for about a pretty decent bit of time here. And I think that we've got a lot of insight here. So I'm going to, I'm not going to wrap us. I'm going to get us to our, last series of questions that we're going to do. It's going to be a little bit different for everybody. We'll start with Lorenzo. We'll go to Grace and then we'll go to Dr. J. And so for Lorenzo and Grace, we end every podcast the same, which is if you go back to yourself as a junior golfer and tell yourself just one thing, what would that one thing be? That's normally the question we ask. In this case, I think it's going to take a little bit of time for maybe you to be that circumspect and to say, hey, what would I tell myself? At this time, so we're gonna do it a little bit differently for this one. Tell us what you would tell yourself four years ago if you go back to yourself four years ago and tell yourself just one thing. And then number two, tell us as far as working with Doctor J, why why you think someone should if someone should work with a mental coach if that's something you think someone should do, why they should do it and the benefits that you've seen for it. So Lorenzo, we'll start with you. That tell yourself something four years ago. And then mental coach. Okay. Well, I'm kind of, I kind of already know what to say a little bit because my brother's kind of in that boat right now and I'm kind of coaching him through this stuff. And so right now, what I would say to myself back then is not to worry so much on performance and, uh, and results and, and pressure on, you know, gosh, you know, I want a future in golf and I really want to play good and I have to play good. You know, I just tell myself, you know, don't worry about that stuff and just play golf. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm just playing golf. I'm not really worrying about the future or, you know, what other people think about me. Just play golf and have fun. And so that's what I'm kind of telling my brother. And that's what I would tell myself back then, because right now he's in a situation where he's putting a lot of pressure on himself. And when you have a lot of pressure on yourself, it's kind of hard to play golf and you're just thinking too much. And so. That's one thing I would say to myself. The other question was why sh- why should people go to a coach or like like uh, Coach Novetsky? A lot of things that mental coaches can tell you because they do know a lot. You know, it it not only just goes with golf, but it, you know, it also works with other stuff too, like um, dealing with people around you that make you really mad. That you know, in school or even just doing school and having tests that come up, and so it won't only just help you with golf. It'll help you with things outside of golf. And the stuff that you learn from it is just so precious that even now I still look back at it and I, I use it. I incorporate it into my practice, incorporate it into my routine, my golf, and pretty much my whole life. And it definitely helps. And before I went into and did a lesson with Coach Novetsky, I was kind of, I mean, I was open-minded, but I had that little little devil on my shoulder, like, you know, why are you, why are you doing this? I mean, do you really, do you really need this guy? Well, what can you learn? What more can you learn? You know, and so just kind of shoved him off my shoulder and kind of I, I learned a lot. And there's a lot more to golf than than there than you really think there is. And so the mental side, having a mental coach and uh, exploring the mental side of golf really helps. So. And Grace, same question to you. you go back to yourself four four years ago. What is one thing you would tell yourself? And then. If you recommend, if you were to recommend someone work with a mental coach, if that's something you believe, what would you tell them? I'd say four years ago, because that was when I just started competitive golf, and I was like, okay, well, I gotta really work really hard. I gotta win these tournaments to show these college coaches like I have the capabilities of playing D one or any division sport level. But I, I think I tell myself success does not come from perfection, because well, first of all, we're playing golf, and it's an extremely hard sport. So we're all going to have good and bad days, and sometimes it's those bad days that will allow us to appreciate those good days. Success does not come from perfection. And at the end, trust yourself with your game. Work hard because that hard work will pay off, and it'll it'll all come back to you um, if you just put your energy and time and passion into it. So. 
I think that was that's one thing I definitely tell myself. And then when I first started, or when Lorenzo introduced me to Dr. J, I was like, like similar to Lorenzo, I was like, there's no way like my mental game affects my game that much. Like there's, there's just no way. <laughs> and at first, like I was like, okay, like like golf is probably eighty percent technique and twenty percent mental. But like today it's definitely 80% mental and 20% technique because like a lot of the things that Dr. J and I have worked on, like as Lorenzo said, I've been able to not only apply it to my golf game, but also to, to just outside of golf, to my peers, to my coaches, to my friends, family. I mean, it's, it's just so special. And so you don't even realize like half the time what you're thinking during your game or even any sport. And so just being able to work and talk with someone about what you're going through, how you feel, and especially with Dr. J, he he knows so much. And just being able to learn from him or just taking advice from others. Because sometimes like we might not be able to see something of us, but other people from the outside can see something about you that you can probably change or you can take us towards a step towards a direction where you can change how you think of yourself or even just how you see the world. So I, I definitely th- uh, recommend a uh, sports psychologist because they've, he, Dr. J has helped me a lot with my game. Thank you. And then Dr. J turning it over to you here. One, is there anything that you wish we would have talked about that we missed at all? And then whether, whether we miss something or not after that, just tell us, a little bit more about what people should expect working with sports performance coach like yourself and what, if someone's out there listening, what you would hope that they would take to heart from hearing Lorenzo and Grace talk with us. Yeah. Well, first I got to thank both of them for their kind words. I mean, it just shows exactly what I think we all need to work on as our character. These two young people have tremendous character. And that's, I think another thing we work on, you know, in our sessions is, you know, what kind of character skills can help us overcome our barriers? And that's definitely another avenue that, you know, as mental performance coaches, we work on, especially with younger people and get to know these guys since they were 14 and see them develop into the wonderful human beings that they are with the support of their families and their other coaches as well. You know, it takes a team and, you know, they've given me a lot of credit, but it's not just me. They, they had to go out and do the work, you know, so I, I feel like I'm a tour guide. And so I can kind of show them like what is possible if they want to do it, but they have to go out and do it. So yeah, you can have all the coaches you want, but if you don't have the discipline like these two have to go out and actually implement the strategies and, and be open-minded enough to try things that are uncomfortable uh, and push through those feelings of being uncomfortable, then you're not going to be successful. And these guys showed that you know that's what it takes. So that they did the work. Absolutely. Well, so I'm going to take us to wrap here. And before we do, I'm going to start with Dr. J and then we'll go Lorenzo Grace. Dr. J, if people want to find you, we've already had an episode with you. They should know where to find you. They should have already reached out to you by now. But if they haven't, where can they find you on social media, on the internet, and ask you more questions, learn more about you? Yeah. So um, champmindset.com is the website. That's the easiest way to find me. And from there, you can um, click on the social icons on the website. But if you Google Champion Mindset Group, which is the name of my business, that's the easiest way to find me. And we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram as well. Happy to answer any DMs if anybody has any questions or wants to learn how to work with me. Thank you so much. And then, Lorenzo, you're headed off to college. If people are trying to find you on social media, if they want to learn more about you, if they want to learn, hey, how did how did he get the things done that he wanted to get done, what would he tell me? Where can they find you on social media? I'm just a huge Instagram guy. So my handle is Lorenzo underscore Panilli. That's that's where I'm really active, post a lot, and they can DM me there. And so Excellent. And Grace, if people want to reach out to you, learn more about your story and follow you, where can they find you? Same thing as Lorenzo. I use Instagram most of the time. So you can follow Grace Wang 111 and that's my account. Excellent. Be sure to give Grace Lorenzo and Dr. J a follow. Check out Dr. J's website. And then if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, 
please subscribe and leave us a rating. If you're listening on YouTube, please like and subscribe. This helps us get our message out to more people. We hope you like this episode. It's kind of a new concept for us. So if you liked it, definitely be sure to let us know. And then if you're trying to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram at the tournament code and on Twitter at tournament code. As always, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. We look forward to diving in deeper to what it takes to play elite tournament golf. Thank <laughs> you.